Uh, hello everyone and welcome back to the Imposter Podcast. Today in this video we have Janga and our new guest Ryan. Um, Ryan, how about you give us a short introduction about yourself? Sure, thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me on too. And uh, uh, Ryan Wei here. Uh, I'm currently on the board of uh, Boga Group, uh, which is one of the bigger names in the F&B at Indonesia. Uh, I'm helping out the owner to build out the group uh, bigger and better. That includes from creating new business on top of the platform and also helping to transform the company and turbocharge from within. Uh, outside of it, I'm also a venture partner at uh, Impact Focused Angel Investment Club, uh, Bali Investment Club. Um, being a serial entrepreneur myself, I think my past journey to date uh, was more at the cross section of uh, investment, technology, and consumer FMB. Having had a professional career before that was in private equity investing for about a decade with uh, large cap European funds and buying out uh, consumer retail companies from Europe to Asia. Then I uh, embarked on a journey, a uh, founder journey myself. First time that was since about six years ago, always been building out uh, consumer facing businesses. And within also coming to the world of F&B, also had a bit of a different flavors uh, from uh, doing buyout deals and growth capital investments back in PE to running country expansion across Asia Pacific for a large global QSR giant. And until now, building out national champion brands in a multi-category setting within Indonesia. So I think that's more like kind of path life in a nutshell. Uh, always a um, recurring common theme, trying to infuse a bit of technology and digital into building uh, enduring accessible consumer brands in the F&B space at a large scale. And also with a dash of uh, capital markets and uh, know-how and perspective. So yeah, nice. Thank you for uh, thank you for the opportunity, and uh, yeah, love to uh, look forward to the discussion. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting what you have just 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 described, and uh, your experience seems to 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 to, to cut through like different aspects of uh, of building business, right? I mean, from 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 different like points of view, and now you're largely a a, a builder. So so we we have built things in Indonesia before. We know that okay, it's actually quite challenging. To build things mm -hmm. from scratch, or even to to reform some of the existing businesses, uh, I mean, naturally because it's a large market, so things are naturally challenging. Um, and and also you had some experience like global, regional in Europe, in China, etc., in Canada. And what what attracted you to to Indonesia? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Sure. Yeah. Uh, yes. I, I still kind of yeah, remember well. That was about four years ago. Uh, I hopped on a one-way flight from London, coming down to Jakarta, uh, bringing a young family. I think that's a route not many traverse, but uh, I never look back. Um, I think why is it's a bit of a confluence of factors. Um, for one, is I've always had this fascination uh, with emerging markets. I think that kind of got instilled in me back in my formative years, back in college. Even I think the book um, "The World Is Flat" that first came out by Thomas Friedman. That was a defining moment, and that also helped kind of shape my career and life track, uh, spanning about seven countries, I think, over the last 20 years or so, mostly in a cross-border capacity. So that's one. And um, also, as I see it, places like Singapore, that is more of a land of professionals. I think the same can be said for Shanghai, Hong Kong, uh, London, New York, Zurich, as far as I remembered. Um, but Indonesia here is a place where, like, say, for one, professional, gold collar, top paying jobs, that's hard to come by, if any. But this is in fact the true dreamland for entrepreneurs. So I think through that lens, as a professional investor turned emerging market entrepreneur, and then that end becomes such a no brainer to me uh, coming down here. Yeah. I, think, I think last I'll say it's also maybe some side factor too. Uh, my better half, my wife is Indonesian, even though we were kind of living happily abroad, but with my eyes and, and heart set on this land, uh, so I knew that this move to Indonesia, pursuing my entrepreneurial dream, if I hadn't taken it, I would have probably regretted it for life. And I, I try to live like Jeff Bezos. Uh, I live life with no regrets. So that I knew back then, it was a move I had to make. So can I say that your better far, half your family is the reason why you didn't go to places like Brazil, <laughs> Turkey, <laughs> Nigeria, but you settled in Indonesia? Uh, yes, indeed. I wanted to be at an emerging marketplace, uh, building out consumer businesses. And then this specific choice, which is why I left places like Europe, UK, US, Canada, and, and China, Singapore, for that matter, behind. But uh, yeah, why specifically Indonesia? I, I felt that, yes, this is, I'm already half foot in the door. Uh, if I didn't do it, I would have regretted it for life. And I don't want that. 
yeah, you had this opportunity. Um, uh, what's interesting, uh, a few years ago when I was, uh, so when I was working for Rocket Internet, we had, we had built a number of businesses. And at that time, we were trying to hire people to lead businesses. Mm -hmm. And lots of people that we ended up interviewing with, they wanted to be in Indonesia. They said, okay, I've read World Bank reports. It's exciting. Mm -hmm. So many people and the consumption power is growing. And, uh, and we do have the so-called middle class, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they all got very excited. Uh, fast forward seven, eight years. Um, I think half of them are still there, but, uh, but yes. half of them have already left. And I've, I think I've spoken with everyone who has left and uh, they all, they all share the same sentiment. It says that it's exciting, but after three to four years, it's, uh, I'm tired because, because the, the market is challenging. There are lots of things that you, it requires lots of patience. There are lots of things that you can't quantify. There are lots of things that you need, need to navigate and need to continuously navigate. So, so that tires lots of people out. And, uh, and how do you see this? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that over the last few years, in Indonesia, you have operated, I mean, different groups, uh, uh, taking different roles, and you have seen your fair share of the challenges. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Yeah, challenges abound, definitely. I think um, there probably different things I can touch on. Uh, for one is, I think here, I'll probably point down to the, the human factor here. Uh, yes, here is a country where uh, labors abound, uh, but talents are not. I think especially those really self-driven with a great intensity, that's really far and few between here. Um, uh, which, of course, if we can, uh, can expand on that, religion, I think, have a big role to play. Uh, the society, you kind of zeitgeist, the operating philosophy people subscribe to in life. And then all, that all kind of dictates the, the, the way of thinking and the way of life and uh, the choices people make. Right? Um, but I think that's kind of more beyond the scope here. But to me, doing any sort of kind of critical thinking, problem solving, uh, any complex creation type of work, yeah, uh, which essentially that's execution in a business building sense. That in fact is probably the biggest challenge, which is to be done with talents and human. Uh, so anything requiring kind of rigor in that, uh, I do feel that's often a lot is left to be desired here. Right. And that of course rigor is more of a catch all phrase. Anything from speed, cadence, uh, quality, uh, consistency, all of that, the depth of thinking and the comprehensiveness. So much of that, I think you probably have to calibrate the expectation uh, and the way and the approach um, in terms of day-to-day -day execution here. I think I think a lot of the issues that you mentioned are related to, to the talent issue. And um, um, I do remember that when the first entrepreneurs from, from say, Hong Kong I mean, moved to invest in, in mainland China in the 1980s, they also faced the issue, right? This issue, right? I mean, I, I, I want to build a business, but I couldn't find people who are um, who are smart enough, who, are, who have the, the the decent education, and uh, and 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 uh, and it was it was just challenging for, for them to, to to find people who can immediately get on onto the work. And uh, I also noticed that uh, I think there are lots of MNCs who have been operating in Indonesia for decades. And I've interacted with uh, some of the senior managers of uh, of these MNCs in Indonesia. They are very smart people. They are very smart people, but they also tell you that okay, uh, we are operating in this market. We understand the challenges. We understand. Uh, the nuance is here, so th that's why I mean that 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 lot, lots of times we can't. I mean, even though we were like, educated in the U.S. in Australia, <clears throat> we need a different kinds of models of to to operate effectively in this market. Um, do you see that as um, as uh, as matter of the stage of the market, or is that a, a matter of uh, just just something inherent and fundamental about the culture mm -hmm. that we just need to have different Hi, hello? Ex ex expectations? Mm -hmm. uh I think, at least from my standpoint, uh, there is something quite structurally fundamental there, right? Uh, pointing to the way, I mean, generally, right, the, the, the population, how people reason, how people go about life, right? I think for one, I would say that also um, Jakarta, in a way, for, the, for those listening from outside, right, in no way that represents Indonesia. Part of Jakarta, I say BD pick, people might know, that by no means even represent greater Jakarta. So, uh, and also the like, first layer of like the counterparts, most people kind of get to interact with, right? Speaking fluent English, well educated from abroad, uh, sharp and crisp and seemingly ambitious too. And that is also by this far from the real faces of Indonesia, whether it be in the workplace uh, or in the marketplace, right? Um, so I think knowing that exactly like you pointed to, uh, that nuance, but essentially 
Indonesia, much of that is really underneath the surface, right, below the tip of the iceberg. And that tip is what people see from abroad. And that tip is only the one that people get to touch on. Um, so I think that is, is, is always it's good to keep in mind uh, for it. Uh, so much of that is behind the scene, it's underneath the surface. The true ground level reality, uh, that especially some, even something like underground, to your point, that's deep rooted, the foundations and fabrics of the society. And uh, that to me is only to be perceived once you're on the ground, but not to be uh, not not visible from a from, from a shore from outside. Interesting. So, so th that in a way makes navigating kind of fascinating, right? Once you <clears throat> you work your way through to to understand and uh, and to to sort of um, to to find a ha a ha, ha moments. That, okay, actually things function this way, and now I just have to figure out a way to navigate through this. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned about um, mm -hmm. the, the iceberg analogy, right? You see the tip of iceberg, uh, iceberg, but there's a lot underneath. And I, th I think here goes all with uh, lots of investors understanding about the Indonesian consumer market as well, right? I mean, people, I'm sure people have been reading like, you know, World Bank reports, uh, Bain reports uh, about, you know, uh, the promising demographics, the middle class urbanization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but there's one question which I've debated with lots of people, and nobody seems to be able to give a clear answer: is that what exactly is middle class, and um, and uh, how many of them are exactly there, and uh, how fast it, is this cohort growing? So, so what's your take? I mean, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be like a uh, concise uh, like numbers, but uh, but but what's your sense about this? Yes, indeed. I think middle class, um, it is, uh, I think, especially um, middle up, right? Uh, that I think is a very often used and abused word here, at least in the, in the, in the local kind of within the brand owner society. Most people think they cater to the middle up, but in fact, that's actually you touching the 1% of the population, in fact. To me, yes, yeah, you're right. Uh, there's um, lots of theory, literature, and statistics from time machine, the macro GDP population, and all that. Uh, uh, I think the path I take from being on the ground over the past few years, uh, coming to my year five in Indonesia soon, um, I would say for one is middle class as a population. Yes, I think officially that's about 20% of the market, which only comes down to, right, uh, in this case, uh, it's, it's a pool of anywhere 30, 40, 50 million um, market by population, right? And those people still, they're, I think per capita, probably I count my point to somewhere to the tune of uh, 10 million, right? It's like a thousand Singapore dollars, maybe monthly level, uh, whether it be spending or uh, or income. Uh, so in fact, the middle class definition is far below what the outside world tends to perceive. Uh, those people are not in, in, a, in a large house. It's not well to do. I don't even drive cars. It's all on a motorbike. Uh, and to them, uh, uh, so I think in short, consumer business from what I see here for one is there's no really a magic number in terms of how you set the prices, right? Whether it be like 50K rupiah, 150 or 500K. There's no right or wrong answer. But to me, it's all about how that fits into like serving the, the segment that who your brand is really after. Uh, like understanding there's a multi-layer of consequences of your design choice of who, who you target. Uh, uh, what I mean by that is, I say the price points. Uh, any price point can then correspond to a certain level of spending or income level of the demographics. But that side of the population as a segment, right, uh, what is your effective reach of that? What is the capture rate? And that leads to a volume. And how that volume then feeds into your store economics, your sales projection. And that determines really not only profitability, but your network scalability. Uh, and also then geographically, how, how dispersed you wanted to reach and pursue. Because here, once you move above and beyond like uh, tier one or getting into the outer cities and beyond all the equations have to reset right the new capability has got to be rebuilt as well it's a whole new different ball game there and so the target market division and all of this full suite of consequences that has to be fully recognized and accounted for i think for anyone as opposed to what is the side of the pool what price should i set no there's at least six or seven at least factors that, that come with it one, the full course of the meal, if you will, right? That's the whole, all the nuts and bolts are figured out and presented. And if that's still something palatable enough, then it's, it's, then it's go time. Then you can dig in. I think, yeah. No, nobody in business today is, is really kind of serving the 280 million Indonesian consumers here. No one is even hitting half of it. Even a quarter of it, I think, is a stretch. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
even Chris. the instant noodles. Even the instant uh, noodles. that's a different play. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, consumer retail products is a bit of a different play. Internet reach, right, and retail FMCG distribution network, which also I had a, a, a discount some years in, uh, that's built over a decade. That's a different play. In the sense of F and B, also I think I see as a two broad category: uh, food retail, CPG, F and CG, as well as food service, right, which is more restaurant, cafe, and such, uh, lifestyle and venues. So that's the other part I guess I'm, I'm, I was referring to. Please. Got it. Got it. Um, so, so, so in that way, um, it's 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 actually quite difficult from uh, a traditional like companies like doing kind of planning, right? Because because traditionally, how companies do, do do the planning, or how how sort of entrepreneurs write write their PhD investors right. is that okay? Uh, here's my target addressable market, and here's here's how I'm going to approach it. I mean, mm -hmm. Exactly as you mentioned, right? The market size, how do I set the price? Uh, what differentiates my product? And now you are saying that okay, there are six or seven factors, and uh, and many of them might not exactly be quanti quantitative. Many of that that I mean might be quantitative, but you might not be able to find sufficient indicators for you to 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 to, to make a proper uh, proper decision. So so at the end of the day, for you to navigate and uh, and uh, make something optimal. Does that come with an iterative approach, or does it come with some, like you know, I don't know, some understanding the market, which is which is in your gut? Mm, not quite. Yes, yeah, even though I, I was saying that, in fact, the underground reality that's important. Right? Uh, but still, to me, again, that is only to shape, like, say, the version zero, version one of your design, right? And that is still something to be hypothesized based on understanding on the ground, not reading the report. But from that point on. Then it still has to be tested out, launch, test, iterate, rinse and repeat and revise. And then through that iterative tech building approach, which rarely is a playbook that many people or anyone uh, pursues in the in the more of a brick and mortar, or at least in the consumer F&B play, uh, from what I noticed. And that over that series of hypothesizing testing, eventually leading to the best design choice, whether it be pricing or the product or the feature or the taste to me. Right. Uh, so yes, uh, yes, it has to go through that series of steps to be done. Uh, but the initial version zero, version one, when first came out of the lab into the real world, that has to be ideally ba on the basis of good enough understanding. But that knowing that that's only a version one, and you need a version five to be a winning design. Mm, which means that I mean, w w when it comes to things like food service, right? We know that um, the, for instance, uh, in in China, how, lo how lots of people do it is that uh, is that they highly uh, leverage the advertising capabilities of uh, of food delivery platforms. I mean, starting mm -hmm. new concepts and trying that out on, on food delivery. At least you can test the dimension of like, you no, know, what the customers would like the taste, what the customers would, would would like the price, what they would become repeat customers before you started like, you know, franchising out or, or, or building your own like sort of full service FMB joints offline. Um, in, in, in Indonesia, I guess that that mandate is probably a little bit more difficult because uh, because the reach of food delivery platforms is not as prevalent as uh, as what we see in China. So so that naturally means that when you test rings, your expectation of speed and how you allocate your resources uh, will probably be, be different, right? I mean, you, you test offline concept I mean, you can't just say that okay tomorrow i'm going to sort of rebrand and do a facelift to my store and do it like version 2.3 and and keep doing that every week for a year and that will require lots of costs mm. mm -hmm. yes indeed yeah so how, how 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 would you do that is that is that how you sort of set the right expectations in terms of timeline or or I mean, how how do you how do you allocate the resources when you actually go through that kind of testing phase? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a general point is I think much of that testing, that way of working, that playbook, wasn't much prevalent for sure, uh, wasn't kind of well adopted here as well, to be honest. Right. So that in fact, for uh, on one hand, it does create that opportunity for wh whoever really can play that playbook super well refined. Uh, to come down here following that similar strategy and tactics and that i do believe that will lead to very different outcomes over time the implementation of that process yes here is execution is harder uh yeah there's external circumstances making it a bit difficult to do i think the operator side too 
right? Executing that with a team, having the right person who understand, right? Not only the language, but the way to play, that is that also blends into the challenge, right? Uh, for many, maybe F and B, there are five things to do, right? And then that'll be it. You can get the store up and running. But in fact, there are at least 15 other things to consider, of which maybe half of them we need to test. And the other half, we can choose strategically to put aside until later, right? But I think the level of thinking and sophistication it was, in fact, that would lead to a very different level of outcome. And but that going the extra mile, deeper, more in depth, uh, wasn't very much recognized here uh, and uh, celebrated for sure too, and adopted. Interesting. So, 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 which, which basically you mean that uh, I mean, lots of the lots of the, the the businesses in food services, I okay. mean, they are doing well, but uh, they could have, I mean, been doing much better compared to where they are today. And, uh, and and because because I mean uh, there, there, there was there was no, no thinking or there was no like pressure that people actually are leaving leaving the money on the table in a way. I I would agree with that uh, assessment and conclusion. In fact, yeah, I think the uh, level of granularity, the level of sophistication, uh, uh, that people apply, uh, is in general is lacking, which could be also a function of really uh, lack of relative lack of competition. In that, yes, lots of brands, but most of them, it's not just the quantity of brand and players out there, but it's a level of playing field, if you will, with the level of playbook that people are following. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, I think in short, yeah, there's plenty of room to optimize. And most people are not really actively taking advantage of it. And to them also, that is a level of sophistication beyond the conventional thinking of maybe running a restaurant, or doing a cafe. Uh, and that, yes, people from the tech world know it by heart. Right? Uh, people from the investment side, capital markets, having seen how the best billion dollar legendary companies got built, they might know that as well. So there are different pages out of different playbooks, I feel, uh, uh, from the investment community, from the tech founder community. Much of that can, in fact, actually be applied over in the consumer MB play here in Indonesia. But then those are the chapters in that playbook that the traditional restaurant way of working in Indonesia uh, that they need to touch on. I think I think lots of people, um, when they talk about this, that they, 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 they touched upon what happened in China and when they, when they assess other other like sort of emerging markets, I mean, of course, whether the challenges that we see in China currently is a different topic, but uh, but China between 2011 and at least 2016 uh, was an amazing growth story, right? Lots of things happened. And uh, I think since at least 2013, 2014, we see the investors talking about, okay, where do we find the next channel? Where do we find the next uh, growth opportunity? Uh, but there are lots of factors in China, which, uh, which back then were fairly unique, right? I mean, almost unlimited funding uh, from, 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 from the US dollar so, so, source, sources. And, um, and, and really, really, I think lots of infrastructure, which was built by the government around the same time, which unleashed, unleashed lots of growth opportunities that, uh, that whoever who was willing or able to capture would grow very fast. That mm -hmm. also uh, translates into, uh, yes. I think, what you have just mentioned, right, the competition. And, and people have seen that, okay, if you seize opportunity, you can grow very fast. If you miss opportunity, your competitor is far ahead of you. So that we have not seen really um, playing out at that kind of intensity anywhere else in this world. Mm -hmm. So, and especially in, in emerging markets. So, so, uh, and of course, there's also debate of uh, of whether that's replicable uh, or not, because um, because we we go to tech in Indonesia, right? I mean, uh, there was there was lots of invest, investment, especially mm -hmm. between 2017 to 2019, and again 2021 when the funding was cheap. But the levels you saw, I mean, compared to what China did uh, back in the early like 2010s, is still quite small and you have not seen a lot of success cases of you know tech founders building successful companies mm -hmm. ipo made lots of money and investing in other tech companies and people feeling like terribly inspired by them and lots of people um started competing in, in the same way and uh, what else, i think i think in southeast asia in general and indonesia in particular we see lots of aspiring uh, entrepreneurs uh, but they don't seem to have an uh, anchor where where they can learn from, where they can actually um, be, be 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 very inspired by in a very practical way, right? I mean, you, you can you can iterate your business, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but we do see that many of them are trying to figure out things themselves, and um, without without like you no know, having like, like mountain there that okay, I'm going to climb. I'm just trying to figure out things myself. 
So, so would you see that as a, as an issue, which which caused um, what we have seen? I mean, whatever that's been adopted in tech in China, in the US, or whatever, you don't see that as much uh, uh, seeping in, in, into the the traditional businesses. Well, as in China, I think uh, traditional businesses are deeply impacted by tech. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, I hear your your this kind of yeah this mountain giant analogy to me. I'm more thinking of the ocean or the pool here. Yeah, okay. yeah, there is competition, and I think to say it's not intense is is not a fair statement too. But then just the pure number of being crowded, but that is purely in the shallow zone, in the deep water zone. I think there's rarely anyone really swimming there, and that's where the beauty is. But that requires a different level of sophistication when you can go really so much underneath the surface, knowing, right, to your point, granularity, thinking through every design choice and executing rigorously day in, day out, testing, learning, data-driven analytics, and then the hypothesizing critical thinking, creative problem solving, all of that. That is what you require uh, in to, to survive and just to do this, like sink into the deep water zone. And that part is... It's plenty. There's nobody there. But in fact, if you look under the surface, uh, that area, uh, that is as crowded as ever. And it's constantly more jumping into it. Right? So that's how I view it in a way, that here. Uh, and understanding there's a deep water zone to tap into. And what's the equipment? What's the technique? What's the process? Know-how you will require before you can ever dream about venturing into that. And how you can better equip yourself to eventually venture out. Once you get down there, you will realize nobody play like this way. And here, essentially, the whole the whole the whole ocean is your oyster, treasure trove, and, and all that abounds. I, I I have spoken with the with the yeah. friends who have built businesses where they hired extensively uh, people from Python's, mm -hmm. and uh, I have also re recently read a book, uh, Elon Musk by Walter Isaacson, and and look at the intensity that he has been driving things. So, 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 what Elon Musk has been doing, what Baidu has been doing in China, uh, you don't really have like you know, that many other businesses which can do it at that level. But, but the very fact of you having these two giants or these two like whatever mountains, whatever out there, and that impacts the whole ecosystem, right? You would have others who are I don't know maybe one third as efficient as these guys, but they are still like drastically more, 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 more competitive compared to whatever, whatever that's out there in the market. Um, I'm just saying that. Uh, do you think it's lack of personality who who actually does things that way in the market, which which sort of inspires the others and and create and and breeds an ecosystem of talent who 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 later join other businesses to actually foster things? Mm -hmm. Yes, I would tend to agree. For one is yeah, less of a role model in a way. Uh, there are lots of examples I can think of where people truly kind of building a I really engineer submarine and really going down there. A lot of people scuba diving, many people on the beach, uh, and that is crowded. And to them, that is what that is all there, there is to tap into. That's what you come to the beach for, as opposed to really deep diving into the bottom of the ocean and finding treasure. Uh, that's how I see the F&B play, uh, which yes, but also there's, I see there's more and more kind of coming on shore, kind of like the onslaught of foreign brands from China, from America, from different places. Singapore, Malaysia, I think too. Uh, as more foreign players come into the region, come into the F&B space here, and then playing in a very different playbook, uh, diving into very different area, different zones of the ocean. And I think believe, and over time, once they start to kind of really dig out the gold and then things start to surface, it might make people realize, oh, there's deeper part of this play I should dive into. Let's delve into that. Mm -hmm. Case in point, I think we all can point to. Uh, there are people here over the span of three years building 3,000 stores. And that is, I think even uh, you did some good, good work on that too. That is Mishri ice cream all around this country. Back then, people were taking decades to build 100 stores. Now they can do thousands in years. And that is a fundamentally a different playbook people are playing. Yeah, their business model could be different. Supply chain, franchise, license sale, that's all different too. But still, that's a matter of execution and the design. Um, and I'm sure the process power they have behind it to manage and, and, and this level of scale, right? That is something traditional restaurant company never had to do when you are running 50 to 100 stores. 
So, so, so you mean that uh, once there's like uh, the catfish, for example, like you Nishi, know, right, who has been yes. uh, operationally much more efficient, coming to the market, and uh, sooner or later they will take the, the, I don't know, market share or whatever away from some of the existing players. That kind of forces the existing players to, to be more competitive. I mean, it's, it's almost like, an, I don't know, what China did in the 1980s, right, allow some of the stronger foreign companies to come in. And initially, there was lots of debate about, okay, you're going to kill the, 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 the domestic industry, but in the end, it made the domestic industry uh, more competitive because, um, because the market is large enough, right? I mean, f and, f and, uh, and you do have enough smart people uh, at the end of the day. Uh, it, the, what they need is just, uh, just incentive or, or, or just, uh, I don't know, uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a whip, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, call it. I mean, but, 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 but some kind of drive for them to, 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 to actually move ahead much faster and some kind of role model they can look at, learn, adapt, and uh, eventually overtake. Yeah, and even just to be inspired by, right? And that has realizing there's a need. Yes, that catfish, catfish effect, I think is very much needed here. And uh, only without over time, at least there's a need, a recognition, something got to be fundamentally different the way they play, not just somebody working harder with more money, but working crazier. It doesn't quite produce an exponentially different level of results, 10x to 100x. So uh, that needs to be reconstructed, anything from scratch. I think that level of recognition and awakening that is needed in the offline sense in the consumer F and B play. And 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 we mentioned about right. Nishia, right? I mean, in consumer F and B, and obviously has been growing like quite aggressively in Indonesia. Uh, on the other hand, we will see see lots of uh, foreign companies, especially tech companies in Indonesia, which are not really producing the results uh, that they hoped, right? I mean, they encounter many challenges, etc. So, so for outsiders to, to come into Indonesia to make the assessment uh, about markets and to actually operate in the market, uh, what are the typical mistakes that you see which are happening again and again uh, from, from, from the companies that you have op been observing? I mean, foreign companies which try to ex try to sort of expand the Indonesian market. Mm -hmm. I think for this, um, I would probably point to there's in general, there's something lacking and there's something a bit of overkill. Um, what I mean by that, I think, of course, the, the, the thing that's lacking, uh, we touched upon already, the lack of realization, recognition, and appreciation, right, from the subtle nuances to even some blatant truths on the ground. These people don't come down here, don't see enough of And uh, so that's one. In this high context, high touch culture, uh, things that need to be perceived on the ground, let alone only then you can over time maybe dig more into it to see what's deep rooted behind that on the ground. So that's one yeah, we touched upon already. Um, uh, what's maybe what I mean by maybe overkill, there's always seems to be an overdose of uh, optimism. Right? And that reflects in the estimation from writing our business plan, investment valuation sometimes too, uh, expecting progress at a certain speed and efficiency. Uh, uh, usually those are done on, on paper from outside. Right? Um, and or expecting that maybe throwing money after any problem, that's the panacea of getting things done, of getting people to move even, right? uh, which also we were saying here, right? Money is not the universal motivator here if you're dealing with the local workforce, um, whether it be white collar or blue collar. Even. So lots of that kind of distorted or even preconceived notion people have from outside thinking what well, worked. This is something I play with human nature. Any human being should be, can be incentivized like this. Any business, we can be executed like that. And that oftentimes need a refresher uh, by the ground reality. And sometimes that's more like a wake up call smashing in their head and uh, come only too late. Um, and at the end of the day, <clears throat> would, you, would you perceive this as, uh, as an issue of the, uh, I don't know, expectations yeah, or patience of the leaders? Because at the end of the day, I mean, we see lots of cases, right? I mean, somebody was say from this e-commerce giant in China, was sent by the leader to to head Indonesian business. Mm -hmm. Initially, they're very optimistic, and after three months, they realized that okay, the market is uh, might take much longer. And of course, uh, uh, the person gets um, uh, the person gets uh, gets 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 a bit uh, um, sort of dejected. And of course, I mean, his pressure would mount, and he would uh, he'd try to do more to actually prove that okay, this market can actually work. And that leads to more frustration and et cetera, et cetera. So we have seen that in, in, in many cases. Uh, 
the question is that uh, the question is that I mean, with all this um, nuances and with all this difficulty to navigate through the market, if I'm an international group and uh, and my my big big boss can't be in Indonesia all the time to fill the market, what should I do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I so think the, like 15 emerging markets we're exploring. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, on this one, I think Indonesia as a as a country or a culture or a market uh, environment, for one, it's, it's not built for the outside world, nor should it, nor should it be that way. Uh, uh, you think of it from whether it be like a mosque or a church or a temple. Uh, I mean, if, if you're really determined to come in, so please do enter with a, with a level of respect, knowing that uh, here, things are going to be opaque, will be nuanced, uh, things probably smell differently when you enter. And the water here is muddy, it's murky sometimes too. Right? So, and you cannot see it through from outside, from ashore. You have to dip your toes and right, to feel the water yourself first before you make any sort of judgment and decision. That's number one. And, and also knowing that if you just to, were to jump in head first, uh, straight to the deep end, all by yourself alone, that's almost a suicide move from, from my, my perspective, in fact. Mm -hmm. right? You'd be either drowning or you you lose your life. Or at a minimum, like you said too, you lose your progress, you lose momentum over time, you lose motivation, and that eventually also leads to a project demise. So uh, my thing in short is get local help, right? Whether you find a co-pilot of your ship uh, to sail in this water, or you find a diving instructor right, who knows this water like back of his hand, they can swim along with you, right? Just like they say in Bali, you just don't attempt diving alone here or anywhere on this archipelago. And we say that the local co-pilots, uh, which who are the possibilities? And uh, of course, I, I deal a lot with the large Chinese businesses, and they tend to have the impression that I need to work with one of the big families, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the, you can name like you know the top five. The dragons, yeah. Mm -hmm. However, yeah, yeah. How, however, slice it because they would believe that these families would have um, the the significant sort of uh, sway uh, mm -hmm. and also significant understanding about the market. And uh, and also it's relatively easy for them to to do to, to, to understand these people, right? I mean, from from background because they have worked with multiple people, and it's easy for them to 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 just speak with the people they've worked with and to say that okay, this group is not reliable in this way. This group is has been very helpful in that way, etc., etc. But but it's it's a massive market. I believe that there, there are lots of people who, who can actually be more effective. Uh, in certain aspects compared to some of the bigger groups because bigger groups they also have more more opportunities i mean whatever you see as the top priority might not be their top top priority because they see bigger opportunities so 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 what's the right way to to, to identify the right local local co-pilot mm -hmm. or, or you just have to dip your tool and talk talk, talk to many people and uh, essentially find that synergy and and uh, and sometimes make mistakes because I I know that uh, you have navigated through through different things and so, and sometimes I mean things might not turn out to be ideal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I will look at this uh, thinking through. One is yes, it's very much of a high context, uh, high touch culture here, hence trust, um, uh, understanding in a way, liking in a way too. That's all that matters too. Right? Um, Westerners, of course, sometimes maybe to them that means they, they might not feel that to the same extent, but even like some people here within Asia, like Oriental, Easterners, they understand too, relationship building, trust building, all of that paves the way. And through that process, you get to understand each other's sides too. What's the aspiration? What's the motivation? Why do they want to do it? Not about what to do. What to do usually is always the last piece. Before that, why we want to do it, how we do things together over time. All of that is ultimately much higher order questions to answer than essentially in the end, what to do and how much of it. Um, so that's before one, I would say, uh, going through that process of really dating, dating over time, to find the perfect local partner to marry yourself into for decades to come. Um, and, uh, that's on trust building, I would say. Right? And also not only capital, right? capital is one C, I would try to think of also commitment, right? Going back to the point of why they want to do this. Of course, they are a local empire. It's one of the dragons out there. They are here for decades. Uh, they, they probably they are the kingmakers even talking about election and whatnot. So for them, running that empire, why why this little venture? Uh, why do they want to do it? They might want to do it today. What about next month and next quarter? And come like strategic planning next year. What about next decade and next generation comes along? 
So figuring out that part of it too, coming down to commitment and alignment, that's more so, right? Because any one of them is more than capable enough to drive this leadership as a co-pilot, uh, even using 1% of their time and, and resources. But to them, it's more about how serious they are in doing and why do they need to. Are you confident with that answer yourself uh, before you put your whole ship into it? Because that thing could be 99% to you, but to them, it's not even one. That also leads to, to 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 another issue, which is about people, right? So, so I didn't know they will say that it's it's one percent of the energy of the group, and, and naturally, if they say that okay, we we are willing to take it, there'll be someone who is driving this, and um, this someone might not be. I mean, at 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 operational level, this someone might not be a, I don't know, um, the the, the CEO of the family or the, or, or or some of the sort of the, the core members of family. They have to assign someone to to drive this. This person is usually someone, someone trusted by them. But uh, but of course, uh, this person would have uh, uh, his or her own nuances and his or her own agenda and also priorities and the way of doing things. Um, and, uh, and and on the other side, uh, for foreign companies trying to enter that by working with the with the with the local co-pilot and and sometimes I mean I mean just just take the recent TikTok shop case by, by example, right? Um, they would have I don't know CEO of a TikTok. Uh, who would be able to, like, you know, uh, help navigate these issues? But uh, he's ultimately not the owner, not the boss. And uh, at the end of the day, so the decision making and also the, the way that he or she or she can mobilize the resources within the group will be different. So, 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 so then you would have a situation where you have a um, a promising, I don't know, joint venture, pa I don't know, collaboration, whatever. And it, but each side is run by a professional manager, <laughs> so. So, 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 I, I mean, lots of things can go wrong during, 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 during this process. And we have seen, uh, I, I think, a fair number of cases where things do go wrong because of misalignment of expectations and, uh, and disagreements on a direction and disagreements on um, how to iterate this, right? I mean, I've invested for the six months and the expectations or, or whatever the results are different from my expectations. What should I do next? Or I run into some regulatory challenges. I mean, who should sort it out, and exactly how this should be sorted out? So, so, so that that's almost inherently challenging if um, if the owners of both parties do not actually come come down and and build some personal trust to to drive this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, quite much so. Hence, you know, you were saying what happens for six months down the line uh, into it. To yeah. me, that's why at the at the outset on both sides. One is building that trust as a foundational fabric, right? Stitching things together. And secondly, I think really from whoever I am it from the outside, try to blend in as much local element into this as possible. Uh, at least on the surface, uh, if not the substance too. And that is, in fact, it is probably the safe and right and smart way to play from what I can see. As you know, there is, yeah, there's protectionism, the nationalism are rising up. This government, next president, likely the same too. So yes, in Indonesia, it's not built for the outside world, nor should it be that way. Same. Hence, if you want to really get a piece of the pie here, I try to understand yourself, blend in yourself. If anything, I learned from my years and decades, like doing cross-border, whether it be deals or business expansion, it's all the big L word for localization. Uh, localize yourself as much as you possibly can, or to the extent is is permissible. Uh, um, and then. Uh, yeah, additional local element. Every single bit helps. Interesting, and uh, and we we have had like lots of discussions with different people about uh, localization, and mm -hmm. uh, and what I did realize is that for many people, when they think about localization, they naturally think about uh, the, the the product level of localization, right? What how yeah. do I make my product that's a mistake format more? Yeah, mm -hmm. more appealing to the local consumer. It is content. Yes, um, but uh, but but uh, yeah, that, that's that's how how we wrote in the whole book that I did with Professor Shen, right? I mean, you mm -hmm. need to localize in in terms of leadership, in terms of your people, in terms of how your organization is structured, because because just the product is not enough. There there, there are, as you said, much deeper issues uh, underneath. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, my my last uh, wouldn't say question, but 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 discussion point is the where, where do you see? 
like opportunities still lying ahead um, in FMB. I mean, I'm, I'm not asking you to to to, to divulge like trade secrets for for potential competitors, but uh, but at at macro level, I mean, how do you see the opportunities? And uh, if um, if to summarize in one word, I mean, how should people actually leverage these opportunities? Be it like you know local local big groups or or or, or foreign uh, companies which which try to like you know, be part of the pile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, for one, is I don't hold any crystal ball, right? Uh, and nobody does. Maybe the one holding the ballot for the coming year. But um, I think in general, I would say, I, t I mean, I'm a big believer that usually the greatest achievement ever in life, I mean, in the history, of, of usually, is not coming from people bucking the trend, but really from following the biggest waves and the tide right? and getting the mega trend right. And of course, everything else has to has to be in place. So, to me, I mean, the Indonesia consumer play, yes. Uh, uh, the rising up of consuming class in the order of you're asking what is the magic number, but at least 60 to 100 million over the coming years and decades. Right? This golden Indonesia 2045, uh, getting to a $10 trillion economy, capital rising up 8x, 10x, getting to an upper middle income country. I'm a buyer there. I'm a believer. And why? Even though most of the Indonesians I talk to, they, I think they, they hold a level of skepticism that, um, and doubt there. To me, because I've taken the front row seat, watching that movie unfold in, with my own eyes in China, not once, but two times in half a lifetime uh, for that. Uh, it's a 100x uh, revolution in a way, per capita level, if you think through it, uh, which only goes back the last two or three decades. So yes, the next two decades of Indo until becoming a golden Indonesia 2045, I can see that's possible because China has done it twice. Uh, Indo has... Uh, of course, that's a different, bigger discussion. You have the fundamental elements in place and whatnot. But I think back to this point, uh, yes, uh, on that level, blended with the demographics dividends, is still consumption needs. Right? How that evolve, how that expand, how they elevate uh, in the consumer sense, from buying today more staples, FMCG, like I said, to discretionary, aspirational spending to come. Uh, eating now is more heavier, eating more and eating heavier. But over time, that becomes morphed into something better and lighter, something fresher and healthier. It will come, not today, not for Indonesia yet, but eventually that is something down the line. Young singles lifestyle, as we all know, millennials, median uh, media uh, media age, but then seeking fun and thrill to that need for social and then marriage, young family, family formation and expansion, parental, generational spending, all is to come. So I think in short, there's plenty of opportunities here within that elevating and expanding consuming lifestyle. Uh, but for one is that time frame is not over the coming quarters and years. It's at the minimum years and decades. But whoever is here determined to play the long game in a very local way, they get to spend, they, they get to stand a chance, really can be uh, well positioned themselves over time, blending in as much local element, well localizing yourself as you can. Um, Yes, the strategy playbook, right? I'm sure we see that. That's not as simple as copy paste. Copy two from America, from China, from anywhere, Singapore. Copy paste replicate a strategy play. Playbook doesn't quite work, but history often repeats itself, right? That in a very strikingly similar way. So I think, yes, that to me, anyone here well positioned and prepared, localizing for the long haul. And there's many, uh, there's uh, much to expect. And that is the mega trend here of Indonesia. And that is very much intact. So you are digging for the long term? Um, yes, I'm localizing all myself, uh, all the way down to the whole nine yard to the next generations, raising my kids around in, uh, Indonesia. Um, cool. I moved around seven times in the last two decades. I'm not going anywhere else in the coming decades. <laughs> Do you wear Batik to work? Uh, not all days of the week, uh, particular occasion I do. I know who I deal with, of course, uh, uh, paying the level of respect, so, you know, entering the temple, entering the mosque, you gotta do what it takes. Of course, mm -hmm. of course, of course. Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I do foresee that over the coming, um, I wouldn't mm -hmm. say decades, but coming months, coming years, and we'll have multiple discussions about, I mean, how things evolve and uh, and what are the, uh, what are the topics, because, because um, believe it or not, I mean, it, it is one of the biggest markets with potential. And especially in, in, in a consumer play, and uh, it's, it's almost for sure that this is where the, the, the biggest opportunities are, right? Mm. 
Thank you very much for the for for the for 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 the time this morning. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed this discussion. Let's mm -hmm. let's keep it up and uh, all the best for your undertaking. I know that it's not easy. I know that you are digging in for for another decade of challenges, mm -hmm. but uh, but but mm -hmm. I I think psychologically you are. Uh, I think much at ease with all the challenges compared to a few years ago. I think uh, I think the excitement has translated into I wouldn't say maturity, but sort of uh, um, the confidence, right? Mm -hmm. And conviction. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, yes. It still gets to me. I mean, Jakarta traffic still wears me out, uh, even though I'm here uh, years and years into it. But uh, as they say, with the emerging markets, uh, nothing is easy, but uh, anything is possible here. Uh, but the right to play. And that is a long haul, the long game. And, uh, but yeah, but uh, thank you for having me on. It's been fun, really. I appreciate this and uh, look forward to uh, keeping up the conversation. Yeah, all the best. Sure, thank you. Cool. Thank you much, Brian, for joining us today. Thank you for this really interesting session of sharing. And uh, yeah, we'll see each other next, uh, during the next episode of the Boss Podcast. See you all next time. Be hard, Catherine. So that